Content warning. The following video contains material that may be harmful or traumatizing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 5. Entropy. Part 2. After that, we can look back to the screen. It was all I could do not to burst out screaming, and my hands were shaking so bad. I could barely hold my, the controller. I knew the game was going to test me if I kept playing, but I had no idea it would go so far or that it was even capable of doing what it just did. I could feel my brain going haywire as I asked myself, did the, did the game just read my mind? That didn't seem possible, but what ex other explanation was there? It was then that I could no longer deny what now, what now seemed obvious. The game is alive. And not only that, it, it, all, it, it also can establish some kind of mental connection with the player. to stop playing. I don't know if it was the game messing with my mind or just my stubborn curiosity, but even with the previous revelation, I really wanted to see this through to the end. Even more than I did before I beat Dementia. Terrifying as it may be, even dangerous, I knew that if I quit playing, I would never be able to stop thinking about it. If I tried to restart the game, it might go back to normal again. How many people ever got to witness something like this firsthand, let alone be able to take screenshots of the whole thing? Fucked up as it was, this was an experience of a lifetime. But even so, I couldn't take any chances with my health. I had the TV remote right next to me, ready to turn off the TV in case I felt I was in actual danger. And if that didn't work, I would plug it. I would pull the plug out of the wall and just run out of the room. Surely that would be enough. Whatever powers the game has, it seemed to be confined to what it can show on the TV and whatever its mental connection could do. The latter was what worried me. I, I still didn't know what I was dealing with, so I wasn't about to underestimate it. I took a break for a few minutes to calm my nerves. And then it was back to the game. And speaking of TVs, uh, there was a TV screen icon right below the white forest I had just left. And because the first animation was so bizarre, I figured I'd try another to see what happens. Although I expected the same animation, I actually got a totally different one. Weird. The music for this one was the Neptune board music. Fitting, I suppose, since it's a fish man and all. I can't help but wonder what the point of all these things are. There was one more TV screen icon, so I figured it must have had have a unique animation on it of its own. I was going to make sure to see what it was before I left Entropy. Then it was time for another level. The gold brick icon was... The closest thing, so I went to that, and I started up a gold labyrinth level. My health and power were refilled. refilled. I'm not sure how or why, but I was glad not to be heading into the unknown nearly dead. I also noticed that my Mothra sprite had shrunk to half its original size. 
the music was slow it was a slow ominous beat with female voice vocals kicking in about a minute into it quite haunting the gold labyrinth itself was an anomaly i'm not sure how this level would have played out if i was using godzilla or angiris This flying seemed necessary just to get around this place. Another thing that caught my attention was that when you go left, your monster actually turns and faces to the left. This sounds stupidly obvious, but in the original game, you were only supposed to move to the right. So when you tried to move to the left, your monster ended up walking or flying backwards. This level was apparently gigantic in size because every time I thought I had reached to the end of it or thought I was going to end up back where I started, I encountered something totally new, like lava blockades, new enemies, and statue faces. And when I, and I found one statue face at a dead end with a wide open-eyed stare. The night Melissa died, she had an expression on her face that looked exactly like this the whole time. Even when she got hit by the truck, she, she still had that same expression. I can't help but feel like something really is staring at me from behind the screen when I look at this. I really didn't want to be reminded of that night anymore, so I left the statue almost as soon as I found it. I needed to find an exit, the exit anyway, which proved to be no simple task. It felt like this level stretched on forever in all directions. I must have wandered around the level for at least 15 minutes before I finally saw something. It was a creature that wasn't gold. Seemingly the only one of its kind in the level, lacking any kind of hover ability like the other creatures. It just walked, in back, for it just walked back and forth on the platform. But it wasn't long after I found it that a flying machine swooped down and grabbed it and then flew off with it. The machine apparently had not seen me, so I decided to follow it to see where it was taking the creature. The machine stopped at a room with a large cauldron-like object in the center. The machine hovered over to the cauldron and dropped the creature into it. The creature came, emerged from a hole in the cauldron's side, now adorned in the same gold color as everything else. The machine flew off. I'm not really sure what to make of all this, but I'm glad I claim, came upon it because... I found the exit soon after. When I got back to the board, I realized that the bosses hadn't moved at all. A bit odd, but it didn't bother me. It made plan planning my route through Entropy easier. There were still two new icons to explore the indigo cliffs, and the black version of the labyrinth. Since there were only three labyrinth icons, which were surrounded by bosses, I played the indigo cliffs first. It was a lot of the blue-green mountains, 
the level graphics had the same shredded look to it. There's also a mul a recolor of the clouds and moon from the to toxic waste jump. The music, if you can call it that, was merely a deep rumbling noise. One of the few things I encountered were these multicolored creatures with big heads emerging from a small cave in the ground. They all made a synchronized shaking sound as they, and they walked to the right in a group after emerging from the cave, ignoring me. Having no other way to go, I followed them through the through. I, fo I followed them on their route. More and more emerged from the cave until the group had about a hundred creatures. Eventually, the pathway ended in a cliff. I was shocked to see that upon reaching the cliff, all the creatures began jumping off into the abyss. I've seen enemies walk off cliffs before, but, but I've never seen NPCs commit mass suicide like this. Very unsettling way to start off a level. I continued on, flying over the various strange animals like the one shown here. Another group of multicolored bobbleheads was jumping up and down only to be snatched up by large birds, which I'm fairly certain are sprite versions of the giant condor from Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. I've defeated some of the condors in battle, but it bothered me that these bobbleheads seem to be so eager to die. If the game itself is alive, perhaps the creatures in these levels are also alive. And some have very unhappy lives if this behavior is any indication. But what provokes them to do this? In the back of my mind, I'm almost suspect that the glowing moon in the sky is the reason. At the end of the level, I saw yet another group of bobbleheads marching up to a large monster and being devoured. This was starting to disgust me, so acting on impulse, I fired off eye beams at both the monster and the bobbleheads. I destroyed the cave. The monster became angry and ran through the remaining bobbleheads to fight me. Although it lacked any ranged attacks, it was relentless but it was no match for me. I was in the home stretch now, up to the bosses. My plan was to go through Batra first, then Megalon, and after that, I would watch the last TV screen, play the Black Labyrinth before fighting Mechagodzilla, and lastly, go through the chase with the Hell Beast. I was curious to see if it would be in a new form again. But first things first, time to beat up Batra. As I expected, he started off in his larva form. The music was Varan's battle theme. Whenever the game puts in a new Godzilla kaiju with one form or another, that other form always shows up. For a game that's otherwise inexplicable, it's rather startling in its consistency and accuracy with the new kaiju bosses. 
the fight started off simple. Larva, ba Larva Batra fought in a similar fashion as Magu Maguma did, charging back and forth and occasionally firing lightning with its horn. During the fight, I noticed that Matra's combative abilities have been altered in my favor. One, the eye beams did twice as much damage as they did originally. Now they were as strong as Godzilla's punches. The poison power was powder was similarly improved. It also did this nice thing where it would actually hit an enemy when you used it. In the original game, even though Mothra could fly, she was unable to fly over an opponent. You would get knocked back the same way uh, as if you just ran into them, which was extremely annoying. But not anymore. I could change direction and fly around, which was a big help because fighting Imago Batra was much like fighting a clone Mothra, but although Batra is distinctly faster and stronger, no longer impeded by its slow-moving larva form, Imago Batra was a fearsome opponent. Although it lacked the horn lightning, it now had a new, more powerful eye beam. Batra could change direction just like I could, so this battle involved a lot of flipping and flying around. It's pretty damn fun, to be honest. So after defeating Batra, I was excited to see what Megalon would be like. But first, I went through an Indigo Cliffs level and shot through a lot of creatures for the health power-ups. So, about Megalon. His music was Gigan's theme. Makes sense, since Gigan was his battle partner in Megalon's one and only film appearance. He was a lot like Mogera, but faster and with more weapons. He starts out by charging off with his drills. I like to fly back and forth around him, which seemed to really annoy him. After a few seconds, he stepped back, turned around, and started spitting out grenades. Those were a pain, because they bounce off. Because they bounce when they hit the ground. Lastly, he started spamming his lightning beam. It only went straight forward, so it was easy to duck under and then shoot him with his eye beams. With eye beams. Overall, I'd describe him as strong, persistent, but dumb. I was now nearing the end of Entropy. I had just taken down Megalon. And I started up the last TV screen to see what I'd get this time. The result... was unpleasant. The music for this gruesome scene was the password theme. Couldn't figure out why this animation was so sinister and violent in comparison to the other two. This whole game seemed to be growing more malevolent. As I went on to finish Entropy, I began to feel drained. It's hard to describe. Like I had suddenly become tired when I wasn't before. Most likely it was just the tension from all that had, that had happened in the game getting to me, but who knows. The last level type on Entropy is what I call the Shadow Labyrinth. 
the scenery was recorded from gold to black, recolored from gold to black. The music was an um, evil ambiance, similar to the unforgiving cold loop, but distinctly different. The music was my first sign that this level was going to be distressing. I traveled through the maze for about a minute and I noticed there weren't any creatures hovering around. It was an odd transmission from transition from the gold labyrinth, which was overrun with creatures, to this level that had nothing at all. But then it might be a good thing. But then this might be a good thing. Maybe there would be, wouldn't be any obstacles and I could get through this level with ease. Then the screen went dark. And almost, and immediately I snapped out of my daze from a few seconds earlier. Everything had been darkened so that the only thing I could see was the Mothra sprite. I couldn't tell where I was going or I ended up frantically running into walls. I heard a noise, the sound of a crowd running through a hallway. And along with the running came the roars. Loud roaring sounds which I would describe as something like a rabid dog the size of an elephant screaming in fury. And I could tell that whatever was making this noise, there were lots of them. I knew there was something there, but I wasn't sure until I did some screen cap editing that I got to see what my pursuers looked like. But at this time, all I, I couldn't see where they were or where I was going. I was literally running blind and, and this mob of beasts eventually caught up with me. All I could think was no, as I saw my life bar rapidly declining. The monsters had taken me down to half of my total health when I was saved. The light came on and the attackers had disappeared. So the challenge to, of this level was revealed. Find an exit. Find the exit before the lights go out and a pack of monsters maul you to death. I was in panic mode now, moving as fast as I could go, while trying every path I could find for a way out. As I played through the level, the lights went out a total of three times. The second time I would have been dead of meat if I hadn't, if it had not been for the wide, one of the wide-eyed statues. As I stayed close to it, the monster seemed to avoid me until the light came out, came back. The statue warded them away somehow. I was safe as long as I stayed near the statue, but at the same time, I had to leave to find the exit. The Shadow Labyrinth turned out to be much smaller than the Gold Labyrinth, as it not only took six minutes, six minutes to navigate to the end, but before the exit, there was a row of halls leading straight down with no way out once entered. You either got to go to the exit before the monsters reach you or you died. Thankfully, I made it out. Only one more boss, Mechagodzilla. I started the battle and got something unexpected. Not only did... 
my life shoot back up to 100% again. It seemed to do that randomly. But instead of a replacement boss, I was, I was fighting Godzilla. But any Godzilla fan worth their salt can figure this out. Mega Godzilla started off like fighting a clone Godzilla, but his disguise burned away after only two, only three life bars. Usually, a transformation only occurred at the halfway point. At this point, it was like fighting Mega Godzilla in the normal game. Felt kind of nice to fight one of the original game enemies for a change. Although he wasn't exactly normal, say he also had a rainbow beam and finger missiles. This prevented me from doing the old trick of backing him into a corner and hitting him with eye beams in a spot where he can't hit me, but that was always a cheek trick anyway. But after getting him down to half health, something weird started to happen. His spray started to glitch in much the same way as Gizaru's had back at the First World. After a few seconds, the glitches began to form a new shape. And thus the game had created not Mecha Godzilla. And I discovered that his visual glitch was somehow related to the game recreating things. The human face on this one gives it a very uncanny look. It was on one of the stronger, stronger replacement monsters and had the most firepower. Pictured here is its mouth beam, which I almost got caught in the middle. Which I got caught in the middle of. Even though it was a bit stronger, it was also slower than its original counterpart and couldn't jump around as much. I won the fight by constantly staying out of its line of fire, bombarding the machine with poison powder as it flew over it. One last thing to do. The Hell Beast Chase. Oh boy, might as well get this over with, I thought. The entropy and chase ended up being exactly what I was afraid of it would be. A labyrinth level. All the other chases, although difficult, were extremely straightforward. You just had to run to the right and not get touched. But this took all the simplicity out of it. There was no telling how big so that this labyrinth would be or where the exit was. And now, not only did I have to constantly backtrack to find my way out, I also have to avoid getting one hit by the one hit killed by the red monster. And for those first 30 seconds, it didn't show up. But I knew it would as I started picking up the pace. I heard a loud flapping noise. And there it was. In a flying form. It flew with bat-like wings and was as fast and relentless as ever. For reasons already stated, this was probably the most nerve-wracking of all the end chases. And as such, I had to keep my focus on the game and not taking screen caps. However, I did take one of the red monster doing something I found very interesting. I had managed to lose it by going through a different path than it apparently expected, and it was blocked from attacking me by one of the organic walls of the Red Labyrinth. 
Or so I thought. It tried clawing through the wall for a second before opening up its mouth and tearing the wall apart with the intestine jaws. But those brief milliseconds that the monster was held back might have been the key to finding the exit. The path to exit was long and complex. From what I remember when I went up and then back towards the left, I'm still not sure why I chose those particular ways. Just a lucky hunch, I guess, I suppose. I was sweating profusely, but my wor but my luck had saved me yet again. I had hoped that it wouldn't run out before I finished the game. There were only two more worlds to go. Next was the penultimate world, called Extus.